My name is Mike Regelman. I'm VP of Sales at Solston. And again, we're gonna we're gonna welcome you to have Dirks uh, get up and be leisurely through this. And uh, John and Lisa, excelled by Solston, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you again for joining us. We know there's a lot of options in this beautiful city, so we appreciate it. Okay. Also, told introductions, I guess. I'm Jonathan Taylor. I head the defense production team at Excel by. I've been in the game industry for 16 years now. Um, and so, at Excel by, we make sure we provide everything that you need for your back end for your game. So, that's like multiplayer servers, uh, cross platform IP, all that good stuff, even up to analytics. So. And I'm Lisa Welch, and I'm the vice president of marketing and experience at Solston. Um, I've got a few decades of uh, marketing background and uh, insights background in video games, uh, working on uh, lots of stuff on the console side especially, um, and I'm super excited to be here tonight. Our uh, gorgeous panelists are Stefan, Nick, and Eric, and I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves, and uh, then we'll unpack our theme tonight. Perfect. Uh, Stefan Eastman, VP of Publishing at Stories, uh, publishing this small little title called Petty 3 in about a month. So, busy with that, some kinks to work out still. Um, also, having heading up a third party publishing unit, so we're trying to publish other developers' games. Uh, I'm super excited about that. Been working with both Solstein and Axel White, full disclosure. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, happy with that. Um, and diving into play knowledge and insights is kind of super exciting. Terrific, nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Nick Bidley, CTO and co-founder of Sprocket Games, um, a little studio, 13 people funded last year, a uh, big craft raised fund. x ride at CCP before that, um, friends of Solston and users of Solston, um, and good friends of Axel Vice as well. So excited to be here. Hey folks, my name is Eric, and I'm the grandson of Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, in about 100 years, when my beard is all white, I will become the next Santa Claus. But Santa said to me, before I can become Santa, I have to learn how to bring joy to the people of the world. That's why now I'm the CEO of the Dude Dreams Game Studio. <laughs> we're the makers of Drive Ahead. It's a gladiator car fight game where you get points by hitting friends in the head with a car. Nice. <laughs> Um, and I didn't even know this about you, Santa, but ironically, my birthday is on Christmas Day. Wow. So here we are. What a blessed event. <laughs> the, um, the theme of our night is connecting audiences, and connecting with the audiences and mastering product perfection. And talking about players and players' experiences, like it's, it's the dopamine of my career. I can't stop talking about it, and I love hearing the perspectives of people who are creating the games and talking about how they approach the audiences for whom they're going to create these amazing experiences. So for you as game creators, where in your studio's creative process, creative development process, do you start thinking about audience? Well, let's start. I can start. I think we have, there's one way of looking at it. I think there's one way we should be doing it. That's one way of that we're doing. A lot of times, game developers especially come up with a fantastic creative idea that they run with. That's maybe not the smartest nor the most profitable way of doing it. So instead of looking at it, I would prefer to look at the, it, where, where's the market, where should we be in the market, where's the gap in the market, and figure that out what are the pain points of, or like where, where can the player go into and have fun? What's the missing piece that we can then figure out and then monetize, obviously? get money. So I think there's two ways. Yes, we can do the looking at a creative idea and then driving that forward and doing it. But it, I think it's long, long winding road and it's also fairly expensive. Do you have any examples do you have any examples of when you started with audience, ended up in one place versus starting in a creative direction and then trying to understand the audience as a fit with that game? Yeah I think I mean PD2 has been live for 10 years. Then we have sort of we, they would have an audience insight. I mean, content developing. And I think we, we start talking as well, especially when we had a call before this. Like, this one way of looking at it from a, a live ops game, and then also coming out with, with a new game as well. Uh, I think with multiple ops, like multiple games, especially from my early when I was working at Wargaming, we, we shut down games all the time. 
Right. And I think we did that because we didn't really look into all the things that we came up with. Really creative ideas that we then tested on. We did test them on marketing and that's what we now that it's blue. So then we kind of shut down. And what are some of the defects that are navigating this understanding the audience kind of anything that you've either experienced or desire to overcome in learning about how to inform your creative process? I think getting getting the insights is the hardest and really like diving into it and, and getting engaged teams to understand because you can have an analytics department you can get in all this data but then getting that actually in to the game development team can be definitely a bit that's definitely hard to uh, uh, example of a success story in that conversation um i would say like we took pd3 is part of it we took audience data from pd2 and really we i think that Somebody from consulting them, but I think 25,000 interviews in depth uh, through the tool that you, you provide. So we got a lot of audience insights that we actually used to both in terms of marketing campaign, but also looking into what triggers the players in the game. Like that part of sort of pedigree yeah, is hopefully we don't know, but it, it, it's looking good. We'll see you next week. Yeah, we'll see, yeah, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see in a month. But it's, it's looking really good. I mean, we get fairly good reviews. So we Sure. Thank you, Stefan. Nick, how about for your team? What are the processes you start considering the audience? Day minus one. So for us, that conversation started before we funded the studio even, before we selected the space we were going to be in. So that's how important that was for us. And it still is today, so we're bringing it throughout the development cycle. We're still in prototype of our first game, which I think is not name or describe too much. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's, it's critical for us to not understand just the genre and what people expect from this, but what the audience is and what they truly want. And sometimes they're not as matched as we think they would be. Um, and so, yeah, as early as possible. And, and consistently as possible as well. Is there a way you could share a story without disclosing too much about maybe how you talked about your audience or how you related to your audience prior to really unpacking your creative direction? I mean, I can, yeah, I can talk in some specifics on that. <laughs> um, we initially had a genre in mind that we wanted to go after. We, we kind of did our own research, did a, a few companies helped us in this as well. Um, and we expected to see um, a strong attachment to that genre from the audience that we had targeted with, within this. And completely to our surprise, that was not the case. The players were more than happy to go with genre to genre, and that blew our mind a little bit and made kind of made us realize that the market for what we were building was much bigger than we anticipated, which is nice. like a joyful realization, really. They don't come as big as that. Um, and so, yeah, it was great, it was great to do it and realize it, but we were a lot less constrained. And, but the consequences of that was that we started to have to look a little broader and, and how we were thinking about the game and for whom we were making it. Um, and then and slightly change, without giving too much detail, slightly change <laughs> how broad a feel we could bring into that genre. I love those moments when you discover the unknown unknown that opens up an entirely new pathway. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nick. Eric, how about for you? Where is the audience uh, factor into your creative equation? Well, I think uh, usually it's too late. So, <laughs> and, uh, and I think we can be honest about it. But, you know, everybody is here because we're passionate about games and you have a vision, you have an idea of the game you want to make. So. Sometimes, you know, asking these questions like, what does the audience want? It's, 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 it's like a distraction to the auteur who already has the vision in their mind. But, but then I, I found that, uh, that uh, what my team often asks me is that, what are we doing? Yeah. What are we doing? So you have to have like this clarity. So how can you have clarity and with the, with, with the, to be sure that you know, this is the way and this is what we're going to focus on. And I feel that this this uh, audience insight has has helped there. And and uh, uh, and obviously we, we once had this conversation that you know Drive Ahead is the game we develop. It's it's going to have a ninth anniversary in May. So the team says that we read the reviews and the ratings and we hang out in the community and even I I hang out there. And we felt that we know our players. But then when we asked them, then we realized that, that we had forgotten something along the way for, for Drivehead because it's a silly premise to, 
get points by hitting your friend in the head with a car. I'm surprising that the number one reason why everybody downloaded was for humor and fun. And then, like, we had maybe gone a little bit another path, tried to, you know, improve LTV or something, and we, we lost a little bit of that fun core, but it allowed us to to move the direction and, and go back to what's fundamental and important to our hacks. That's a great example. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I was actually wondering, so you're talking about setting a vision for the team, and you talked a little bit about how you do that in this area, like certain things you do to make sure that you're on the same page of where you want to go with the team. Well, I think like in these days with the with difficult to get investments and user acquisition is challenging and you know studios studios struggle with this audience uh, uh, discovery. Uh, it's important to get everybody on board and understand what we're doing together. And not just with the team, we found that uh, this audience insight that if you can somehow quantify that, that the that, that helps in presenting the, the business case to, to many partners because we used to think of almost the shame to say this, but like market potential is defined by taking top grossing lists as far as you have energy to do it, then you calculate consumer spend together. And it's like this is the market, but it's not. It's like how many consumers are there who could potentially like this game and how much money do they spend on the games uh, on some time frame like monthly level and then you calculate that together that is the market potential and this is like i feel that uh, often these like product strategy decisions are are made you know uh, too much by like reacting to what you see in, in the media or top grossing lists and then like thinking that hey we need to have that feature also oh, that's great i'm gonna do a little bit of a pivot so in my past life, I did a lot of multiplayer and live service games, and we always found that playtesting both internally and externally is really important. I wanted to talk with you guys about this. Like, so if you could share with me like a bit about your playtesting process and like how important it is in making a game on my own. I'll go first on this one. Yes. Um, super important. We we play test every day. We build the game every night, and we play test it um, on platform. Every day, the whole team is invited to it. Not everybody joins every day, um, but we have found that first of all, it's a it's a good moment to spend time together. Uh, ours is a multiplayer game and also a fully remote studio, uh, so maybe it's a weird combination, but um, it's kind of neat to use our own product and our own game to spend time together. Uh, but also, without that aspect, just that velocity, that ability, you know, five times a week, four times a week to See a change, evaluate it, reflect on it, see if it's good, see if it's bad, see how it feels, and then change it again. And um, when we went to daily ones, it was really transformational. And the velocity at which we could improve the product um, over time. We don't really have external play, play that yet, so I'll let, I'll let the others talk to that. Yeah, I can chime in. I think I fully agree with you. Play tests are super, super important. We, also, we don't have daily play tests, but we have uh, weekly ones in, within the studio. But then we also have external play tests. Well, of course, QA as well. But then also tapping into the beta group, like that's core, that's people that's been with us. So it's about 100 people, something like that, that we get tremendous insight. But so you need to be careful there as well, because if you only come and listen to that audience, you're not going to get the game that's commercially successful. So you need to pick what those people are saying, especially if they're, for example, hardcore users of Payday 2, as an example. They want to see certain things in, in Payday 3 that's not going to be commercially viable. Uh, and one thing I want to stress out as well, that's not really playtest, but it is a playtest, is mock reviews. Like, do mock reviews early when you're logging in. You're going to get almost to the point of what your game is going to have. As a, I mean, Metacritic score, you have to talk about, but it still has an impact. I think our Metacritic scores are coming in now, but I think we had that journalist coming in and doing that a year ago. And I think we're going to be very spot on. So you you can then be prepared. You can then pivot to a certain degree. Um, but it, I think it's super important to have, have playtests and listen to your players. Uh, and then it's scaling them up and do have betas, do have alphas. Uh, I love like PUBG's way of doing, or uh, Blue Hole way of doing PUBG. I, I love it. I think it was a tremendous model. Like really, really good way of doing it. 
So really an early alpha to influencers, show the game, get their feedback, implement that, have a cadence of two week rotations coming up with new updates. But that sets a lot of demands on the development team as well to be able to do that. So we're not ready for that, but I'm, that's where I want to be for the next project. You know, Finland has one of the best schools in the world and in our public education, kids are sent outside like every hour or so to play rain or snow. And, and I think like as game developers, we need the same that uh, in this remote setting or flex setting, we can of course have these like, uh, you know, meetings to discuss the game and stuff like that. But then you need to have this like uncontrolled play time where, where you know, if you play Every day, then then these ideas just emerge in that situation. So that's why I, I'm all for like playing on device and, and then playing together with the team because you never know what that conversation will lead to. It can generate some new ideas. That's awesome. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like your tools and process around play testing. Is there anything that you use to find that particularly valuable, or is there any sort of like process you follow that really helps with that play testing? Piece? I mean, I can describe ours uh, of an unreleased game perspective. Um, where Sprocket is founded by tech people primarily, we hire a tech heavy type people. Um, and so from day one, we decided tooling was super important for us and we invested aggressively in that area. So we, we CI build uh, Team City, if somebody's interested. Um, uh, our Unreal game is finally check in, and then every night we make a formal build. We release it to Steam, we release it to the Play Store, and so people get their game from where they, or their, their daily game from where they generally get their game. And the, the, the frick, we, we found that doing it that way reduced the friction to the absolute minimum um, we can get to. Um, and if we want them to play daily, then like the, the cost of that activity has to be really, really low. Um, if not, you, you don't want to spend hours getting a build and then it doesn't work. Or, and so on and so forth. So we, we really removed all frictions we could from that environment. Um, and you know, this was done six or seven months into the lifetime of the studio, uh, and it's paid its you know investment multiple times over already. We'll yeah. do it again that way, but with for sure. You also have the, the different processes and, and things for different type of play tests. Because of course you have the internal one that you're speaking about, and that has its own and we have the other process for that and Fill out this Google sheet with, with bugs and, and development issues and things that you want to fix, but then you have this whole different process when you go external. And it's a whole different process when you when you do map or beta and do those kinds of things. And then you're, you're tapping into thousands of people or hundreds of thousands, thousands of people. They need to sort of schedule that, but they will have tools that, um, to help us uh, and get that feedback back as well. Which I cannot remember the name, but anyway. Is there like surveys and things? Or yeah. Kind of, kind of and all my tools to help sort of get that in and get it down and do point scoring systems and then like to, I need to bolt on, on the features that we want to see or not see and bugs, what it wants. Uh, always online, it seems to be a thing that people don't want. I think we're, we've covered it. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, guys. It's, it's always great to hear the perspectives of people that I don't get to sit deep with and, and unpack your different processes and approaches. So thank you for sharing. Um, my last question is going to be around, um, you know, there's different ways that people relate or talk about uh, playtesting, uh, player insights, audience insights, and that oftentimes people will go, oh, I don't have time for that. It's just going to slow us down. Uh, how are you experiencing it as an accelerant, having those insights as an accelerant in the process or a de-risker in your creative uh, development process? Yeah, I think uh, we're all human beings and people are afraid to mess up. Mm -hmm. So I know at least you don't like when people say that this uh, consumer player insight is like insurance, but it, that, that is one <laughs> way to yeah. use it. Uh, but you know, maybe a better way to say it is to like find the focus and what is what is what is really essential and uh yeah i think like the just like i just remember the first time when we were in a roadmap meeting 
And the team said that we should do this because it's what the players want. And, and that's like based on data instead of like, hey, I was playing a game and there's like <laughs> this game I like, you know, they, they did something and maybe we should try it because we, uh, for a long time, uh, we were like catching up thinking that if we want to increase the lifetime value of our users, like what are the features that are missing in our game now? Let's like as quickly as possible put them there. And then we realized that in, in order to win in the market, you have to be ahead of the game. So like people don't download our game because finally now it has something that something else had like earlier. So like we, we have to be ahead of the game. This this player insight is like the only thing that can help us understand what, what it is that they want next. I feel like, I, I just a side comment on that, I feel like for the people that have experienced the light of getting that player feedback, it's, it is seen as a creative generator, as a path opener, as, as much as it is a focus finder. So it's really great to hear, to hear that that's uh, opened up on your side of the creative process. But I think it doesn't slow you down, it gives you up. It's that it gives you focus. So instead of you, you take shortcuts by getting the data in, and if you can get it early instead of getting it two years down the line. Finding out in market. Yeah. Right. <laughs> when it's the most expensive and painful. Yes. You yeah, go to market and spend, especially mobile, spend a lot of money and then you don't get any. That's scary. Nick, your thoughts on yeah. de-risking, accelerant? How I, do you see I, it? I don't think anybody can afford not to do it. Um, it it's just wasted money and time. The sooner you can realize a bad idea, the better. So on that angle alone, like as fast as possible is the correct one. And then being data informed or data driven, people call it different things. And Riot Games like to call it data informed. Uh, so sometimes they work against the data anyway, even though they have it. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's the only thing you can do. Everything else is just taking a random you know, chances and then hoping that it lands at the end after a year or two. <laughs> Where were you guys like two decades ago in my career? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's it, to my years. One thing is there's a cost to getting it, and I think that's why, especially smaller studios, are scared of getting it because I mean, it's an investment from I'm guessing about twenty-five thousand up to twenty-five thousand dollars to get a proper research done, doing all those things. That it is an investment that can on paper and in the PL look really scary. Uh, but I'm I'm forcing it in on all even the, the smallest third party publishing titles, I'm forcing it into the PL. There needs to be a research budget in there to be able to understand this and getting the, the feedback into the into the game. So it's gonna speed us up in the end and gonna not spend that much money on it in the long run, even though it looks like it costs. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's really been an unfolding over time. I, our orientation just as an industry, as a business, I feel is, we've watched that evolution over the last 20 years. So terrific that you're finding so much is both in that shift. John? Yeah, so we're going to end with a broader question. It's our last one tonight. So like, what is like one big thing, like an insight you've had about like player behavior, player experience, or just about like making games in general from like people that broad that you'd like to share with them? I can start. Um, I think mine is pe players say a lot of things and then they do it the opposite way, or they do things. Yeah, we don't want my my transactions as a thing. Then they still end up buying the shit out. <laughs> it's like you, we don't want DSCs, but then they will still buy them. So it's like they will say certain things, especially in forums and things like that, and then they will go and do kind of the opposite because they will buy into things and not. Of course, listen to your audience, that's not one thing, so please listen to your audience, but they, especially when it comes to monetization, that is the thing that they need, don't listen to it. That's like the spirit of what Nick said, it's uh, data informed, not data dictated, or <laughs> whatever term you used. Interesting. Well, I think for me, it is that uh, you can't assume things about uh, players, or you can't think that everybody is like you or thinks the same way as you. So we, we had a, a debate with the team about the recurring subscriptions. And, and for the team, they were like, 
some some team members like it, liked it, but others felt that well, is this like really a good idea for mobile games? And 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 then we looked at the the data we had, and we we noticed that there's a big portion of players in our game that want the steady progression, and and they don't like like the randomness of of some free to play monetization mechanics. So they know that okay, if I commit to some challenge, that this is what I get out of it. And and uh, and then I, and then we looked at like how they spend otherwise on entertainment and then up end are like like I don't know X six or seven like uh, gaming subscription services and like, well maybe they would like to spend money there again but we just never gave them a good enough reason yeah, and, then, and and then, like the people who like it they really love it and you don't have to force it on the others who don't like buy it but for those it's like really the perfect no-brainer deal that I want to spend like five bucks a month on this game. Nice. Nice. Opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, for me, the biggest revelation or surprise um, was that players were less charm constrained than we thought. There were a lot more friend group constraints. Mm -hmm. And we, we didn't really go into this expecting that, but we poked around, um, around it and we realized that the, the market size that we had predicted was actually smaller than it really was. As in, there was more people willing to play the game who were naked, um, uh, because people want to play with their friends. Which I don't know. In retrospect, sounds completely <laughs> obvious, right? When you say it, when you hear it. But somehow along the way, maybe we forgot that like people like to have fun together and, and spend time. But um, yeah, people will hop between the genre much more than I anticipated and we anticipated, and um, and they'll, they'll go with their friends and for where their friends are importantly. So that was, that was quite a surprise to us. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's one of those foundational nuggets of wisdom that you're like, wow, this is going to apply across all the titles that I work on, even though we discover some of those things within a, a particular game experience. So but those were such beautiful stories. Thank you. I want to see if anybody's got any questions for our panelists before we wrap it up and let you keep uh, cocktailing and snacking. <laughs> Um, hi, um, thank you all very much for, for the panel. Um, one question is um, starting with a with a quote. You know, like Ford uh, said, uh, if I had to ask my customers what they want, they would say like fast reports. And so, um, to what extent do you consider that market insight and therefore to some extent, not fully, but to some extent, audience insight is a lagging parameter in the sense of if you have a breakthrough creative vision, like when Dota emerged, or League of Legends emerged, or when Fortnite came into existence, or and so on, um, to what extent is it reconcilable with existing audience insight as to what players actually want, and to what extent should like? Obviously, if you're creating like another Match 3 game or another 4X game or another platformer, like you have a very, very large basis to go off, like in terms of reference games and so on. But to what extent is this even applicable when you're creating something that hasn't really been done and when you're dealing with a very blue ocean type of audience? Thank you. But I mean, just still test it. Or we're able to. Sure, you, you can start. So there's a blue ocean, you can look at that, and that, that is your market. Then. You see, okay, nobody else has done this. There's nothing. So there, but there is still a market out there for these players. So you can still see, if we're doing something super revolutionary, nobody else has ever done it. Perfect, you do have a market for it. And then you can go, and then you can develop that, and then you can go and test it. And then, obviously, it comes down to play fun. Is it fun? Then it's even more of a market. So that's how they, you can always test. But I think that the question is that who and what do you want to be? It's okay to be an artist. You know, if you have that vision, then just go do it. That's perfectly fine. But if if you want to be a game studio, then you're making a game for a user segment, and and, and then the the purpose of the company is to create and maintain customer relationships in that market. So that, that's the, the goal of business. You can 
see uh, Peter Drucker, 1952 or 54. The purpose of a company is to create and maintain customer relationships. That's, by the way, how it uh, creates uh, shareholder value. Uh, and and uh, so the, we have heard people say that the best games can live for decades when they're developed with communities. And I, I think it's so. But it's a lot more than asking that, do you like this? Do you want this? Do you want this or that? So that's like asking those questions that allows you to gain that insight that, you know, uh, what gets gets these people to play and spend money in games? Like, how do they think, feel when they're playing those games? And there's no early enough. That doesn't stop you from doing something and exploring an undone idea. There might be a reason it's never been done. Um, and you should go and figure out if perhaps the reason is not the one you expect it to be. Uh, like, an untapped, broad, open market is what we all dream of. Uh, a dead end is what we all fear. And so finding a way to not walk into that early is, is paramount, I think. Now, if you're doing an art thing, I agree. Nothing matters. You do your thing. You have all the power to you. And if not, test as much as you can, as early as you can, and put it in front of people, whatever you have, to validate your assumptions that you have, in fact, the, the magic sauce that we all strive for. Do you ever have conversations with friends and they say that, I dream about starting a small cafe. Like, it's not easier doing a small restaurant or a small, you know, like why why would you make all that effort to keep it small? So like, I guess the question that I would ask the team that do you want to make your vision of the game or do you want to make a game that will be remembered forever? So are you, are you like, which is more important for you? And like, like we discussed that, well, what is the North Star metric for us? And you know, I, I originally said that that our North Star metric is to grow our day ninety lifetime value by X percent by the certain you know day. And of course, obviously, nobody cared about that. But then we we started talking about, well, well, what is the like? What is important for us is that you know we want to have loyal and valuable users. So we started following this, the absolute number of paying users. And if we do these updates, can we go from measuring them in I Ikea buses to air buses, and then those cruise boats that go between Helsinki and Stockholm. So that's kind of like your definition of success. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, and I think I'm gonna ask it. And the question is, I, I want to tap into the audience insights of the audience we have here. Do we want to go drinky? Or do you want to ask one more question? Or number three, do you want to ask questions while you're drinking? We can all just mingle and you can approach your own panelists with your own question. Uh, votes? One, two, or three? Who's got votes for one? Wow. Nobody's, everybody's yeah. afraid of putting Somebody up their have questions? Do I have another question in the audience? All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna pick that guy with the glasses. Okay. Sorry. Oh, appreciate it. Sorry, Eugenio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we showed up a little bit late, so sorry if this has already been asked. But I was gonna ask, um, when you know, obviously we're also big believers in testing early and often. And for your guys' experience when it comes to feedback, how much are you prioritizing the size of the kind of metadata that you collect in terms of the number of users that you're testing with? versus the quality of that feedback in terms of organizations, groups, or, or even internal uh, kind of alpha playtester groups that will maybe give you more detailed feedback. Like, where do you kind of sit on that scale of it's the quality of the feedback and how in-depth it is is what's most important versus when does it move to more of a, we want to see all the, all the metadata through the patterns. Fine, I'll start. Um, both are important, but they're just different. They're, they're, they're completely different things from where we're sitting. So internal play tests are from a play testing team or, or vetted, you know, recurrent play testers have one quality to them. They'll, they'll help you navigate your day to day or your week to week, get some feedback on something, try a thing, back out if it's not working. But like your eyes are not fresh and they're not really your, your market audience. They're not really the people that will vote with your wallet when the game comes out. They have a relationship with you. They're, 
if it's your employee, then it's even it's even worse in some ways, right? That they're playing the game that they would want to make maybe, and, and so it's not quite right. So I'd say you got to do both. You got to do you know your fast fast pace returns internal or, or semi internal type of testing, and then never forget that at the end of the day, you're not making a war game. You're making the game for for a player somewhere, and, and you have to find them, whoever that is, and then go and go get their opinion. Yes, yeah, so I didn't. So when we did the product segmentation, you can, for marketing only for for KD3, I did both. So I didn't trust. So I did all three. So I looked at KD2 to get the small spend, and then I looked at qual quantitative research uh, with uh, with Nielsen as well, and I went out interviewing. I think we interviewed about two thousand people, and then we also had some sort of filling in forms and stuff like that. And then I think no five thousand people, and then we had. Qualitative interviews were 500 of them. So I did all of those two. So and I think you do need to do all of them. Then it comes into different when in the lifetime of the project mm -hmm. as well. So you need to start it. You probably start out small and ask those kind of questions in the beginning because also you don't want to spend $250,000 on an external research when you have sort of a game pitch. But, so you need to sort of look into, but really start out, look again. I'm also advocating for. Where's the gap in the market? Do research on that and then set the foundation pillars for the game that you're going to be developing and give that to the development team. Because then already there you have a head start. Yeah. Do you think those numbers are about the right? 5,500 for a That was what I put in the budget, so that's what we got. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere along those lines, yes. <laughs> Uh, and 20, we got 25,000 from the research we did on, on our old audience of KD2. So that was, I think that's, I like around 20,000 respondents when it comes to, to sort of the current game. So that really sets the, and you have a lot of data and it's really like secure. But I mean, you can work with a whole, a way smaller subset of I think that you guys know a lot about. You could ask me about it later. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, thank you to our awesome panel. Let's give them a little round of appreciation. Thank you. Um, thank you all for giving us your time and attention and your Wednesday night. Please talk to our panelists and enjoy the rest of your evenings and all of you have a safe journey home. Thank you. Excelbyte. Celebrate boring launches.